Hello WeatherTech students and welcome to your first lecture here on meteorology within the virtual component of spring 2020. Uh, starting off with the background image on my laptop, that is Taffy, the day that we got her from Homeward Bound in Mishawaka. Uh, she's about four to five months old in that image, so hopefully that starts your lecture off on a bright note. So we're going to go ahead and work our way into the lecture portion here. Uh, you see my top hat opening up on the screen. My join code is 602987. Uh, for reference, Kevin's is 393390. Again, 393390. We're going to see how this works today. Uh, it may be a little bit of a learning curve, but we're going to try to work things so there is a chance for you to do some interaction should you desire. And of course, we're going to show you that we're going to glitch in general because this is not where we were supposed to be at the beginning. Uh, looking here again at mid-latitude cyclones, talking about the cyclone tracks along with the associated precipitation. So some of this is going to feel a little bit repetitive uh, from some previous lectures, but that's also going to mean that this is a good way to step into things. And so when we think about precipitation, we need to first and foremost consider that we need some clouds. And what do we need in order to get these clouds to form? Uh, the three main ingredients are cloud condensation nuclei, uh, some moisture source, and also a source of lift. Uh, keeping in mind that in our current atmosphere, cloud condensation nuclei are not a concern. There are plenty of CCNs ranging from uh, salt particles to uh, other forms of pollution in the atmosphere, and so they're always readily available. And we can have lift in the atmosphere. Uh, but not receive or experience cloudiness. So that source of moisture becomes absolutely critical in order to get uh, precipitation uh, from a cloud. And so we think about the precipitation processes that we talked about back in MET 103, the idea of the bergeron fin Dyson or our cold cloud process that involves ice crystals. And then as we get down to the tropic regions, we experience more of the collision coalescence or the CC method. And so if we have enough moisture, we have enough lift, we obviously are going to have those CCN. If we get enough lift for a period of time, that's when we can start to experience precipitation. And so we'll look a little bit about the cloud types along with the precipitation expected when we deal with different frontal boundaries in our atmosphere. And so here we're looking at a schematic of the warm front in our 3D, remembering that our warm frontal boundaries are going to have a much more gentle slope associated with them. And here we see that this is going to produce a relatively slow but steady amount of precipitation as we gently lift warm air uh, northward or poleward, we should say, of the warm frontal boundary. And so this is going to result in layered clouds, oftentimes a expanse of stratus type clouds ahead of your warm front, uh, slowly making clouds that are higher and higher in the atmosphere and less prone to produce some sort of precipitation. Uh, with our warm frontal boundary, the fact that we're taking this warm moist air and causing it to go above a dome of cold air that's receding to the polar regions, uh, here we may experience potentially some of that frozen or mixed precipitation as we move uh, north of our warm frontal boundary. And so again, in this schematic, we may see a large area of precipitation out ahead of a warm front. That's not always the case. Again, all precipitation setups are not created equal. And so as we move on forward to the cold frontal boundary, uh, the big difference again between our cold frontal and warm frontal boundary in the three-dimensional setup is that we're going to have a much steeper, much more abrupt st uh, slope associated with our cold frontal boundary. And again, we see this warm air. Remembering our warm air is going to have the capacity to hold more moisture, and that's going to be lifted up relatively quickly right along and behind that cold frontal boundary. And so oftentimes we see more precipitation just in the wake of that cold frontal boundary. Uh, remember back to slightly before break when we talked and spent some time discussing how to pick out these boundaries and you've just gotten done reading the Sanders and Doswell article from 1995, uh, identifying where these are and one of, of course, the ways that we can help to identify these boundaries is where precipitation is, but that's not going to be the number one way in which we look to see where precipitation is located. Uh, we can get convective precipitation, which may be intense along a cold frontal boundary, uh, but we're not necessarily going to have as large of an expanse of precipitation along with our cold frontal boundary. Uh, one thing to remember with our mid-latitude cyclones as we look forward uh, is we have an area in between your warm front and your cold front, that warm uh, 
warm sector of your cyclone. And oftentimes we have sparse precipitation in this area, and that's because we don't have as much of a uh, present lifting mechanism. Uh, we can get simply some daytime heating that can help to initiate showers and thunderstorms in the warm sector, but there's not a clear lifting mechanism that is going to force widespread precipitation within that warm sector of the cyclone. And so here as we look out into a much larger scale, you can see where we oftentimes will find larger expanses of precip associated with a mature here starting to weaken because we're already occluded mid-latitude cyclone. Uh, a lot of precipitation may occur around your low with uh, steady lift. You may also find again that expanse ahead of your warm front, more isolated along your cold frontal boundary uh, with some areas as you get trailing further and further away from your parent low and away from your moisture sources, here being the Gulf of Mexico as the primary moisture source, seeing less and less precipitation. And so we'll conclude the discussion today looking at some of the favored cyclone tracks. And the cyclone tracks are important because the track of the cyclone is going to help to dictate what type of precipitation uh, and how much precipitation we may find in a given area. If you harken back to MET 103, you may remember our video, uh, Storm of the Century, a National Geographic video which showed our superstorm of 1993 and the fact that there was a lot of difference between a few of our numerical weather models at the time, uh, one coming inland and producing a much weaker cyclone, one going out to sea uh, well into the Atlantic Ocean and therefore not producing nearly impacts to the United States, and another which hugged the eastern seaboard, which would have produced the most devastating impact. Impacts. And forecasters correctly honed in on that path, uh, producing notable and memorable and to this point still historical weather conditions, including 13 inches of snow down in Birmingham, Alabama. And so you can see here that would have best conformed with some combination of the Gulf Coast Cyclone and East Coast Cyclone track. But a couple of the other ones we're going to look at at this time are the Alberta Cyclone and the Denver Cyclone. And one of the things that we really consider here in the Midwest, focusing on the Valpo Chicago area, is the importance of the storm track in producing both A, precipitation amounts, and B, the amount of, or also the type of precipitation you may see in a given area. And so if we look first and foremost at the Denver cyclone, actually let's stop and take a look at the Alberta cyclone. Uh, the Alberta cyclone is going to be one of these tracks that comes not shockingly from Canada, uh, our province of Alberta, in and around that area. Sometimes you even hear a buzzword nowadays, the Saskatchewan screamer. They just come up with different terms, but they're similar in the way in which they behave and the impacts uh, here in the Midwest and throughout much of the northern tier of the United States. Alberta cyclones are oftentimes associated with cold weather, especially in the wake of an Alberta cyclone, and are common producers of snowfall, but the fact that the track is so far away from a moisture source, namely the Gulf of Mexico, means that we're not going to get sufficient uh, moisture and therefore be able to produce heavy types of uh, precip, especially snowfall in our area. We can expect, depending on the intensity of the cyclone, to get strong pressure gradients as well as some strong winds. The other type of storm that is going to go near Valparaiso would be your Denver cyclone or your Hooker cyclone. And this is going to be the type of cyclone that is often going to cause forecasters a lot of consternation. The idea of if the cyclone moves, for instance, near St. Louis and towards Indianapolis, we may be here in Valpo and Chicago in the prime area to get some very heavy snowfall, but a jog of 100 miles further to the north may mean that we start to see rainfall or some form of mixed precipitation. And so thinking of the Denver cyclone, uh, we're further uh, away from some of the coldest air, so we can oftentimes wrap some really warm air ahead of a cyclone, but that influx of maritime tropical air may also result in uh, some additional moisture coming into this type of a cyclone, and therefore you may get a more prolific system in terms of prolonged heavy snow depending on the speed and the duration of precipitation across the area. Uh, again, the East Coast and Gulf Coast cyclones are going to be ones that have the ability to tap into that heat source of the oceans, remembering our Gulf Stream current that is located off the southeastern United States. Uh, 
For the Midwest and Valpo, we typically don't see heavy snowfall. In fact, we may see no precipitation here due to the proximity of the parent cyclone to Valpo. Uh, but at the same point, you may see some strong winds. Uh, you may see some much colder air come in behind that type of a cyclone. And there is an occasional setup if the flow is northerly of some lake effect type snowfall within wintertime that may fall across our area. And so we'll steep a little bit of tea. We see a question here. You can feel free to work on this now, or you can feel free to work on it on your own as you pull up these top hat slides. The idea of which of the following is not true regarding the impacts on Valpo from the various cyclone tracks. And so if we go ahead and open it up, and unfortunately it's a little bit off my screen, the idea of which of the following is not going to be true uh, regarding the impacts on Valpo from various cyclone tracks. Uh, a being the Denver cyclones are the most prolific snowfall producers when on the north side of the cyclone track. B, east coast cyclones have no impact on the weather at Valpo. And C, Alberta clippers often produce snow, but rarely heavy precip due to the limited moisture content. And so I'll pause here naturally for a moment or two and see if you can come up with a little bit of an answer to this question on your own. Okay, uh, the answer here would be B, East Coast Cyclones have no impact. Uh, although again, they may not produce substantial precipitation at Valpo, they can absolutely impact the weather in terms of very cold air, oftentimes strong winds, and as mentioned, we may get some lake effect snow within our area. And so we'll wrap up this lecture by looking a little bit at the GFS model. Uh, again, I'm recording this well before the time that you'll actually be looking at the video, and so we're looking out at the GFS uh, valid for this upcoming Thursday, Friday, and into Saturday time frame. And so in this quick example, we're looking here at 850 millibars, and you can see here, uh, this is at the 204 hour point, we are seeing some type of low pressure forming in the lee of the Rockies. Again, realizing that the lee of terrain is a preferred region for these cyclones to develop. You can see warm air out ahead of our cyclone and some cold air already starting to wrap in. And so as we step forward, every six hours, or every three hours here, I should say, you can see again some strong flow as we're starting to increase our height gradient. Again, looking here at 850 millibars, which is a good uh, way to get a quick look at where we might expect some stronger impacts from this type of cyclone. A couple things to mention here, this would be looking to 12Z on Friday. So this would be Friday morning as you would be getting ready to wake up and come to weather technology if we were in a typical environment. And again, this area of flow off the Gulf, we don't have a direct flow from the Gulf up towards Valpo, but still we're gonna bring some warm moist air up in this maritime tropical air mass and this colder continental polar air mass helping to wrap in behind, creating a strong gradient in temperatures. And this will set us up well for our lecture next time on things such as temperature advections. And so although not perfect, we can see our low at this point as we work our way into later morning Friday, the low at 850 millibars passing nearly over Valparaiso, bringing in some of that cold air at 850 behind it, whereas even at the same latitude, much, much warmer in the warm sector of this cyclone off to the east. And so if we do take a quick moment and actually look at the precipitation associated with this, we're gonna step back, looking as it forms out in the lee of the Rockies, now this isn't a true Denver cyclone track, but it at least is going to mimic that. Again, we talk about the uh, preferred ways, but all cyclones have a little bit of difference in the way in which they behave. And so you can pretty easily, if you just look at the pressure line, start to pick out where we may have some type of a warm frontal boundary, where we have might, some, might, might have some type of a trailing cold frontal boundary. And then you see these dash lines. These are gonna be looking at things such as thickness. And that thickness uh, is going to be something else that we look at moving down the road. And so you can see some precipitation breaking out and becoming more expansive, both around our cyclone as it develops, 
especially here ahead of that warm frontal boundary. If we look at this kink in the pressure lines, we may have some type of cold frontal boundary working its way through the Arclitex region and a little bit of trailing precipitation, potentially another secondary cold front back here uh, with, again, some trailing precipitation. We'll talk a little bit more about things such as a deformation zone as you move forward in your meteorological curriculum. Expansive precip, again, around your low, but especially out here in the vicinity of any type of warm frontal boundary. And so, again, not a canonical Denver cyclone, but still an interesting scenario in which to look at to move through things as we get into cyclone tracks. That's all for today. I'm out of time. Have a good one.